Okay, we're recording. So Bryant is here wearing state gear. Curry is online. Darby is here. Fisher's online. Hamilton is online. Hellman is here. Ashley's here and state gear. Crystal's online. Taylor's here. Chase is here in state gear. Rollins is not here. Saunders is online. Shamblin is here in the state gear. Vargas is not here. Uh, am I missing anyone? Looks like Fisher, Miller, Hampton. Yep, everybody's online. It's kind of all right. Um, so yeah, so I got the good question. Yes, today. If, we are meeting for lab in person, bring a computer. It is a virtual experiment, but you need to be here to do it, unless you've already done it, and I've already done it, in which case there's no need for you to come in. Vargas is here. Um, and then, yeah, the exam is on Friday. Again, it's going to be virtual, so you don't want to bring a computer and do it all night. Um, and like I said, the most recent, or one of the most more recent announcements, if you miss the exam, you just, Probably going to get a zero because this is the third exam. I get it the first two times it happened. I'm like, oh, I didn't know it was today. You're supposed to show up anyway, right? So come to class. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you miss it this time, you'll probably get a zero, but maybe I'll let you take it late. And again, the later it is, the harder it is that your version is going to be. Because it's only fair, right? Everybody else took it on Friday. It would be fair for you to take it up on Monday and have a, the same version because technically you had the same amount of time to uh, study. So to prepare for the exam, like I know I've already said this, but do the study guides. If you, if we can pull it off, and I doubt we can at this point, it's not much time, we can meet and I can go over the study guides with you and tell you what are the wrong, right answers and wrong answers and what answer is going to be on the exam or which questions will be on the exam and which won't. But again, we probably won't have time to do that, but I did meet one of your classmates and she let me record it. So, and I posted that video, so I highly recommend watching it. Another one, another thing I highly recommend doing, some of you have been absent for a lot you missed a lot of classes, whether it be in person or online. So I also recommend going back and watching those videos of me giving the lecture of the stuff and about to test you on. So it's up to you. Ball's in your court. I'll try my best to help you between now and Friday, but it's you know kind of short on time. So any questions about anything? All right. Let's see if we can wrap this chapter up since it will be on the um, exam. Next thing we're talking about is mutations. This is actually very important because. The chapter after this, the whole next section, we're going to start going into um, evolution. And you can't have evolution without mutation. Um, and you'll see why we get there. But anyway, what is a mutation? You should know this for the exam. A mutation is any change in a nucleotide sequence of the DNA, right? So if you change the code, that's a mutation. Throw back to what we've been talking about for the past week. You know, your DNA codes, is the A's, the T's, and the C's, and the G's, right? Those are the letters. Those letters make words, and those words describe how we're going to build a protein. So if you change any of those letters, that is what a mutation is. Um, I probably won't ask you this, but there you go. These mutations can involve large regions of chromosomes. So if there's issues with swapping over or crossing over, things like that. Um, they can involve single nucleotide pairs, like we've already talked about when we talked about single cell. So the whole gene, all those letters, there was one letter that was swapped out and that causes a whole disease. And of course, it can be anywhere, anything in between those. Um, the first word for attendance is going to be, let's say, change is the first word for attendance. So, of course, if you're in person, you can send these words in for extra credit as usual. If you're online, currently live, send those words in for your points. And if you're watching the video, this time again, I want you to make a, send me a sentence using that word. But also don't forget to look at the instructions. So when you're watching the videos, go to the list of videos and read the instructions, because if you see it every day, it also asks for something additional, like tell me what you did this weekend or whatever it may be. Anyway, any questions about what a mutation is before we really dive into the different types of mutations and how they work? All right, here's the single cell example. I bet you need to memorize this. Those, I'm definitely not gonna give you a question and say, which letter was substituted for which letter in the sickle cell or in this mutation where we went from a T to an A? I'm not going to do that, but yes, this is a great example, right? So the word used to be spelled CTT, which called for this um, amino acid eventually. 
But instead, you switch out, switch out one letter, and now you have CAT, and then that calls for a completely different amino acid, which would make a completely different shaped protein, which means it would either just completely not work, or it might have some issues. Here's something else you need to know for the exam. There are two categories of mutations. Substitutions is one category, and the other one deletions or insertions. Luckily, these are pretty easy, right, because it's kind of in the name. For example, the first one we're going to talk about is a substitution. Now, what do you think a substitution is based on, on the name? What do you think that means? What is being substituted? No guesses? Come on. You guys can figure this out. What do you think, what do you think it means to substitute? What, what's being substituted? <clears throat> so one we just looked at. I don't know if you guys are afraid to take a guess, but right here, this word used to be GGC. That word we call it codons, right? It used to be GGC. Now we substituted the G for an A. So now we have AGC. It's a completely different word. And in this case, it calls for a completely different amino acid. So again, that's a substitution. So you have all these amino acids, but now because you've changed one letter, one of those amino acids is the wrong one. That being said, here's a really tough one, guys. What do you think an insertion or a deletion is? If that's a substitution, what do you think uh, an insertion or a deletion is? An insertion or a deletion, the next one we're going to talk about. Well, actually, the next one is an, a deletion. What do you think a deletion is? What, what are we talking about? Delete what? Nothing? You guys are shy? Surely you get this. It's in the name, deletion. So substitution, we substituted a letter. Deletion, we're deleting a letter. So now instead of having a GGC, we've deleted the G. Whoops. I'm sorry. Instead of having a UUU, GGC, so on and so forth, we deleted that U. I should turn the camera on. Glad I remember that. Excuse me, guys. Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Much better. Anyway. Yes, so instead of having the U, 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 we have deleted this U, right? But you have to imagine. Now, instead of just having one problem, we've got all kinds of problems. Because now that we've deleted that, everything else has shifted. And we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit more. But for now, that's the introduction to what a deletion is. So, that being said, I'm not even going to ask you, because you guys have to know this, but for some reason you're not answering. What do you think an insertion is? An insertion is kind of the opposite of a deletion. We are inserting a new, um, a new, a new base, right? So in this case, instead of, again, instead of a U, 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 and then a G, we've inserted this U right here in between those other U's. So now we have UUG, right? We've changed all the codes all the way down. And again, we'll come back to that too. But for now, the basics are very simple, right? Substitution is we've substituted one letter for the other. Deletion is we've deleted a letter. Um, insertion is we've inserted an extra letter. Now, that to me, in my opinion, is the easy part. This part's a little bit more complicated, and you also need to know this. What is a missense mutation? That is the change of the amino acid coding. So, so far, everything I've shown you is a missense mutation. Now, I'm going to come back to this for those of you taking notes, but I'm also going to back up and look at the things we've already seen. That's the first one we looked at. The first one was a substitution. But it was a miss, it's also, also a missense, right? Because we have changed the amino acid code. We changed that letter, therefore we went from this amino acid to that amino acid. So that is a missense mutation. This deletion was also a missense um, situation, right? Mutation, because instead of having those amino acids, when we deleted it, now we have these amino acids, right? So again, we changed the coding for the amino acids. And then finally, the one we just saw most recently, the insertion was again a missense mutation because instead of having these amino acids, we have those amino acids. So that is what a missense mutation is. Most likely on the exam, if you have a question about it, I'm not going to ask you the definition of a missense mutation. I would just give you the situation and say, what kind of mutation was it? And you say, oh yeah, that's missense because we have changed the code, right? We now have a different amino acid than we did to begin with. Now, that would be different than what's called a nonsense mutation. And we talked about that earlier when we were talking about the code, the genetic code, um, when we were talking about translation. 
and I showed you the three codes that are the stop codons. Because remember, you do need to know what a stop codon is. You don't need to know that, for example, one of them is UGA. You don't need to know that. But remember, you do need to know that a stop codon says, all right, this is where trans translation stops. We're done with it, right? So that would result in a smaller protein. Well, that's what a nonsense mutation would do. It would change one code. For example, again, not that you need to know this, but UGA, that is one of the three codes that says stop. That's a stop uh, codon. So let's say the original code was supposed to be, I don't know, UUA, right? But then we had a substitution mutation that changed the U to a G, and that is then a nonsense mutation because you've changed it to a stop codon. And yet there's another one. So we've talked about deletions and insertions. These are both collectively known as frame shift mutations. And that'll make a little bit more sense um, when I show you the next picture. Because literally you're shifting the whole frame. And I kind of hinted at that when I showed you, right? When I said we deleted this or inserted this, we didn't just change one amino acid. We changed all the amino acids down, downstream from it. And again, that'll make a little bit more sense on the next slide when I show you the picture. But as you can imagine, that'll have a very disastrous effect. Because again, remember with the substitutions, you change one letter, right? And when you change that one letter, you change one amino acid. Everything else is okay. Everything, well, everything else is normal, so to speak, in the protein. But if you have this frame shift mutation, and you shift everything, everything is changed, all the amino acids from that point down, that's obviously going to be a bigger deal than changing just one amino acid. And that's what I'm going to share on the next slide. So are there any questions about this slide? All right, so this picture is not from your textbook, but it does a great job trying to, or a great job showing what I'm talking about. So here's this code, right? This is the original code. This is what it's supposed to be. Um, in this case, actually it doesn't do that good of a job. But in this case, imagine something was inserted here or deleted down there, it doesn't matter. And what happened is instead of this being the word and then this being the word, everything shifted. So it's no longer C-A-T, it is now A-T-T. -T. It is no longer TCA, it is now CAC, right? Everything shifted by one. So that's what these yellow blocks indicate, right? So these are the original strand of amino acids. And now, because you inserted one thing or deleted one thing, everything shifted. So that changed all the words downstream. And that's what we call, again, a frame shift mutation. And if you're studying, this is probably the best thing to study. Once you understand it, this is the best thing to study because this summarizes it all. This little table right here. This is not from your textbook, this is from your older textbook. So again, the two different types of mutations, you have substitutions or insertions or deletions, those speak for themselves. And then we talk about their effect, right? Um, so we already talked about the fact that a substitution mutation can lead to a missense, right? So again, you swap out one amino acid for the other. Or it could have resulted in a nonsense, which again, could change a regular code codon to a stop codon, which stops the whole process. Then there's another one which I haven't mentioned yet, which is the silent mutation. So if you remember correctly, or if you remember, there's that wheel that I showed you. I'm not even going to try to draw it. <laughs> the basics. Um, there was a wheel that had uh, what, A, U, G, C, right? And then from there, you could translate your uh, you could translate your codons. But if you remember correctly, or if you remember, excuse me, um, for every codon, there wasn't exactly that one codon and then one amino acid, right? For some amino acids, there was a few codons that said, hey, this is amino acid. My point being, in a substitution, sometimes you can change the, the, the codon, but you still might have a codon that codes for the same amino acid. And that's what a silent substitution is. And you need to know that too. So a silent, essentially, yes, you change the number of the letter, but there's no change to the uh, protein. And then of course, like we've already talked about, again, insertions and deletions, those are usually the worst because once you change, once you pull one out or pull it an extra in, you shifted the whole thing. So you've changed all the codes on the downstream. So those are the bigger deals. Any questions about this? All right. Um, I'm probably not gonna ask you about this. So now I'm not. We'll start about it very quickly. Mutations can occur in a number of ways, and 
This one we've already talked about, right? There's errors in DNA replication and recombination. So as we're going through, um, you know, DNA, excuse me, uh, yeah, the S phase of interphase, right? So when we're duplicating the, the chromosomes, sometimes there's a mistake. That's where it can happen that way. And remember, we talked about G1 and G2 and all the things where they stop before they go to G1 and they stop before they go to G2. That way they can check to make sure there's no um, errors. And sometimes it doesn't work, right? So that's where that comes from. And then there's actually stuff called mutagens. And probably that's more relevant for you um, because those are the things that you actually have a little bit of control over. You can't help it if there's a mistake when you're going through mitosis. But you can help this stuff, right? Um, a lot of common physical mutagens are high energy radiations such as x-rays, right? That's why you've got to wear this vest at the dentist when you get x-rays. Um, UV rays, right? That's why you're supposed to wear a sunblock or get shaved or wear proper clothing, right? Because that literally does mutate your DNA. Um, and there's chemical mutagens. I won't even get into it. You can look it up for our independent work. So a lot of times when people say, hey, that causes cancer, that food causes cancer, that drink causes cancer, that's chemical, that smoke causes cancer. That's usually what they're talking about. Um, anyway, any questions about that? All right, the next word for attendance would be avoid. So again, usual stuff. If you're here right now or if you're online right now, just send the words later. Uh, if you're watching the video afterwards, use it in a sentence. Next one. Often harmful or mutated, excuse me, we're talking about mutations again, or still. They can often be harmful, but sometimes they can be beneficial. That's not a, nothing I'm going to ask you about, so I'll put an X next to that. But again, this is a great segue, even though we're not doing it at this very moment, but on Monday, we're going to start talking about natural selection. Actually, yeah, even in lab, we're going to talk about natural selection. So this is really important for you to even understand lab, right? This is where it all comes from. So as you're going to learn, and hopefully you already have, because you've done the pre-lab. Pre yes, there was a pre-lab. So surely you've already done the pre-lab, and you already know all this stuff right here, right? So it's all about variations. That's how we have evolution, is because this thing is slightly different than this thing. And maybe this thing is slightly advantageous. Therefore, that's going to help them survive. If that's going to help them reproduce, therefore, whatever trait it was that helped them do that, it's going to get passed down from generation to generation. And over time, that trait is going to become more amplified. And again, it all boils down to this, all these mutations. If I have time, I'll try to come up with a list. Excuse me, I've got a great book on it, and there's so many interesting mutations. Some of them are not harmful, some of them are really harmful, some of them are small, some of them are huge, like there's dolphins, I think there's a dolphins or whales. Anyway, there's some kind of aquatic mammal where just one mutation caused them to get their little limbs back. Because remember, I don't know if you know, but dolphins and whales originally were on land, and then they evolved to go back to the sea. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll cover that later. As far as grading is concerned and exams are concerned, it's not important. So here we go. Now we get to the next section. So I'll remind you, in your textbook, this, I think, believe, is chapter 17. So to me, it makes more sense, and you'll see why. So when we're talking about mutations and we're talking about transcription and translation, basically viruses are mostly just some different version of transcription and translation. So that's what we'll talk about. Um, there'd be very few questions, if any, on the exam about this. But again, chapter 17, I believe, is the chapter um, that you want to look at, reading it from the textbook. So viruses, they share characteristics of living organisms in that they have genetic material in the form of nucleic acid packaged in highly organized structures, right? So do we, that's what we have in common with viruses. However, viruses are generally not considered alive because first of all, they're not cellular. And if you remember from way back in chapter one, we talked about the properties of life. That was the first one I mentioned. Is it cellular, right? And if it's not cellular, it's not alive. And another thing, going back to those properties of life, remember what the other thing we talked about was reproduction, right? Life reproduces on its own. Viruses cannot reproduce on their own. Speaking of reproduction, if there's a test question on that, then this is the answer, right? If I had to boil this one exam down that says, what was this exam about? It would kind of boil it down to reprodu reproduction, right? There's meiosis and mitosis, that's all about reproduction, sexual and asexual. Heredity, that's about, or genetics, right? That's about the results of reproduction. And here, when we're talking about transcription and translation, it's kind of stretching it a little bit, but it's kind of close. 
some people guessed that from the last exam and maybe said like we kept talking about energy, 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 energy getting transformed from this and that, and someone answered that that, was, that, that exam was about reproduction. But we never talked about reproduction once in exam two. Viruses, let's talk about them some more. Your old textbook defines them as this, your new textbook is slightly different, but it doesn't matter because I'm not gonna ask you the definition, but there are infectious particles consisting of genes in a box. And when I say genes in a box, what I mean is there are nucleic acids wrapped in a protein coat. Notice I didn't say DNA or RNA. That wasn't specific because there's actually both, and we'll talk about them both. In some cases, that envelope is then surrounded by an envelope of membrane, which makes it even more close to being cellular, right? Because our cells are our cells have an envelope of membrane. Anyway, again, viruses cannot reproduce on their own. Therefore, they have to infect living cells and direct basically all those machines you learned about. That's what viruses do, right? So you know about transcription. You know about translation. So even though I'm about to tell you this in detail, just think about it, right? If it injects DNA and it can trick our cells into doing it, then our, RN, our, our RNA polymerase will read their, their DNA and produce their mRNA, which would then produce their proteins. Or it could even skip that step, right? And then sometimes viruses will insert their RNA, right? And then our, if it tricks our cells, then our ribosomes will read the RNA and build the proteins. Anyway, here's one picture of one type of protein. So you can see this happens to be a DNA, excuse me, not protein, um, but what type of virus. You can see this is the DNA virus. There's the DNA inside of it. And we have a protein coat on the outside. Now we're going to talk about different types. And this is really easy because they're in a name. Bacteriophages. What do you think those things attack? Bacteria. It's in the name, right? Viruses that attack bacteria. A lot of times they're called phages for short. If anything, and I'm probably not going to ask you anything, but if anything, you just need to know this first main bullet point, at least on this slide, right? What are, what are bacteriophages? They're viruses that attack bacteria. Yes, they uh, consist of DNA that's enclosed in the structure of the proteins, but again, if I ask anything about that I'm, or about this particular type of virus, I'm not going to ask you that. Here's a drawing of what one looks like. Here's an actual microscope picture of what they look like. There's three of them. So this is the cell. These three have attached themselves to the cell. They're going to in inject their genetic material. This one already has, so is this one. And yeah, there's the head and the tail. It tells you how big they are. I'm certainly not going to ask you all that stuff. Here's a better picture. Again, not from your textbook. This is from your old textbook. So they almost look like little hypodermic needles, and they kind of almost are. So they attach, right? They inject their genetic material. Um, in this case, the genetic material, and we're going to talk about this later too, it actually incorporates itself into the bacteria's genetic material. And eventually, we make more proteins. The thing blows up. We'll talk about that in a second. That's just an example. There's nothing to memorize there. There's something else you might need to know for the exam. But when we're talking about bacteriophages, there's two different cycles, and you need to know the difference between the two of them. There's the lytic cycle, and there's the lysogenic cycle. What is the long, what's the longer word, lytic or lysogenic? Now this is not an English class, but what's the longer word, lytic or lysogenic? Lysogenic, right? Yes, and as a student, that's always what helped me remember the difference between the two. Because not only is lysogenic the longer word, it's also the longer cycle. And I'll talk about that moving forward. Um, but yeah, basically the lytic cycle kills it right away, and the lysogenic cycle is kind of a prolonged thing. Um, and again, I'm going to show you, there's going to be slides that explain this and gives you visualizations, but for now, I'll briefly describe it. So again, the lytic cycle is very short. The DNA gets put in there. The DNA is uh, transcribed right away. It's translated right away. All those proteins to build a new uh, viruses are made. New viruses are built so much so that it blows the cell up and then those uh, viruses leave and affect other cells. Lysogenic cycle doesn't do that. Lysogenic cycle, they inject the genetic material. And that genetic material, like I showed you in that previous picture, it kind of inserts itself into the original bacteria um, genetic material. And that's known as a prophage, right? So then it's just sitting there. It's not doing any harm yet, but it's sitting there and it's now into the genetic material of the, of the uh, bacteria. 
So now every time it goes through mitosis, it's making a perfect copy of the virus until finally it says, all right, enough of that. And then the lysogenic cycle goes into the lytic cycle. And that's, again, that's when it kills it. But this will make more sense when I show you a picture. Also, if you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video of what we're talking about. You can also watch this little video of the lysogenic cycle. But here we go. This is the lytic cycle, pretty simple. Um, so the virus attaches itself to the, to the bacteria. It inserts its genetic material. So there you go. You've got the virus genetic material right there. You've got the blue bacterial genetic material. Um, transcription happens, translation happens. We're building new viruses now inside the bacteria cell. There they are, there's a bunch of them. Eventually there's so many that the cell explodes and then those things go out to infect a new cell and the cycle continues. Make sense? Pretty simple. Lysogenic cycle, it's pretty simple too, but not as simple. Here we go again, the phage attacks and inserts its genetic material. So far, everything's looking the same, right? Except here's where it gets a little bit different. Now, that genetic material is not re tra transcribed and translated right away. It inserts itself into the original bacterial chromosome. So now it's just sitting there not doing anything, right? It's kind of harmless for now. So now every time this cell reproduces, it's going to make a perfect copy of its own DNA plus the new prophage. So now there's two of them, right? And they can do that over and over and over and over again until finally, well, yeah, until finally, eventually, there we go on the next slide. At some point, one of these many cells that have um, duplicated themselves will eventually go into the lytic cycle, and then, you know, we already talked about that, right? The whole thing explodes, the cycle continues. And what we don't get to talk about much, you can read about it in chapter 11 if you want. This is actually really helpful for us humans, and we do this actually in Hamlin Hall. This is how they clone stuff. So a lot of times when people think of clones, they think of like that one, what was that name of that sheep? Dolly the sheep, right? We cloned a whole animal. That is a little bit more rare, but we clone things all the time in this building. Usually we're, um, we'll clone genes, for example. So let's say we want, to, we want a bunch of copies of one certain gene. We'll take that gene out, we'll cut it out, we'll put it into a bacteria using a virus or something close to a virus. And then once we have that into that bacteria, then that bacteria duplicates as bacteria do, and it keeps making all these perfect copies of the gene for us. So yeah, we use viruses for things like this. It's also, if some of you, I think, have read the articles that I posted, we can use this for like gene therapy, right? So this is one of the ways we can insert genes into our own chromosomes that we need by using viruses. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, moving forward. Plant viruses. Guess what plant viruses attack? Plants. Um, the only thing interesting, not interesting, the only thing that kind of makes them unique um, as opposed to the other viruses that we're going to learn about is they're not necessarily deadly to plants. Usually they just kind of stunt plant growth, which isn't trivial, you know, because if you're a farmer, then stunting your plant growth can be very bad, right? It's going to cost you a lot of money. But yeah, that's usually what it does. Um, usually they're RNA. Viruses, usually plant viruses, are RNA viruses, I might ask you that. You definitely don't really need to know, any, know anything about the TMV, but that's just a great example. Um, it's a tobacco mosaic virus. It's rod-shaped, has spiral arrangement of proteins. That's what you're seeing right here, rod-shaped. These little purple things are proteins. As the name might imply, tobacco mosaic virus, it infects tobacco and other related plants. You can look that up for independent work if you want. Speaking of which, independent work is done this Sunday. You should have 100 points by this Sunday. So if you haven't turned anything in, you're going to be in a room awakening. It's, those of you who've turned my stuff in, you know how I grade, right? It's not straightforward. Like I cut this out and I cut that out and I combine this. So you might think you just turned in 10 points worth of work or 10 pages worth of work and you didn't. Anyway, you're ready to do that for independent work if you want. Um, one thing you definitely don't need to know is that TMB causes Discolored spots on leaves, and it was the first virus discovered, which is probably why many textbooks talk about it. But again, I'm not going to ask you any questions about that. If anything, know the plant viruses are mostly RNA, and they're not necessarily deadly, but they're also not good for the plants. Any questions about this slide before we show you some more pictures of this kind of stuff? All right, here's a tobacco leaf that's been infected with a tobacco mosaic virus. 
Which is kind of silly because unless you've seen a tobacco leaf up close and personal that's healthy, you have no point of comparison, so that might not look weird to you. Um, but anyway, yeah, that one's been affected. Here's a drawing. We're going to zoom into this section of it. And again, you can see the spiral of protein wrapped around the spiral of RNA. Any questions about that slide? All right, this whole next slide is definitely not going to be on your exam. I'm just going to talk about it very quickly. These plant viruses have to get past the plant epidermis, right? So they don't, plants don't necessarily breathe like we do. I mean, they do have gas exchange, but they're, they don't have sex, right? At least not the way we do. They do exchange sperm and egg. But anyway, to get infected, they have to get past the epidermis. Therefore, a damaged plant is more likely to be infected, right? So if some tree accidentally gets cut, its leaf gets cut, or maybe even the bark gets deep enough, it's more likely to be infected. Also, sometimes insects carry viruses because, because, again, sometimes insects like to tap into the plant and suck the moisture out, in which case it would be getting past the plant epidermis. And, of course, if you're on a damaged plant that's more likely to be infected, then obviously farming tools can spread viruses, right? So if you're cutting off, you know, whatever part of the plant that you're trying to harvest, then you've opened it up, you've opened up the plant epidermis, and it's more likely to be infected. Um, your book also points out that there's no cure for most viral plant diseases. So for that reason, agriculture is, you know, or, you know, farms, things like that. So you're usually not looking for cures, or excuse me, um, yeah, no cures. You're usually looking to prevent it in, in the beginning. And also to breed genetically engineered varieties that resist viral infections. Any questions about plant viruses? All right, next thing we'll talk about is animal viruses. We can go through this pretty quickly, too. Um, the next thing, let's see, this is just, this next slide is more of an introduction. There's probably not going to be any test questions on this. But as you probably know, for animals, viruses are very common causes of disease, especially right now. You know, we just got out of the pandemic, right? COVID-19 was a virus. And this was written prior to COVID-19, but at the time, there was no greater health threat than influenza. And right now, it's probably tied. I'd have to look up the numbers. But like this season, I don't know what's more dangerous, flu or uh, COVID-19. But anyway, like many animal viruses, um, the flu virus has an outer envelope of a phospholipid membrane with spikes of proteins, and the membrane enables it to enter and leave the host cell. Not that you need to know that, but that kind of makes sense, right? Because remember, plant cells have plant or cell walls. We don't, right? So it kind of makes sense that a virus that affects um, the human, excuse me, animals, including humans, would have that phospholipid bilayer as an envelope. That way, it just kind of merge right in. Many animal viruses have RNA. A lot of them have DNA. The book specifies which are which. So RNA includes flu, common cold. And because common cold is a coronavirus, same thing with COVID-19. Measles, mumps, AIDS, polio. Um, HIV include hepatitis, chickenpox, herpes. You do not need to know which is which. I'm not going to ask you that. So there will be no questions when I say, is AIDS an RNA virus or a DNA virus? Actually, AIDS is a bad example. There are a few questions about AIDS, I think, on the study guide. But anyway, I'm not going to ask you to remember which is which. So any questions so far? I'm trying to go through this quickly. I want to finish this today. Here's another picture. Again, we have the, the membrane on the outside, right? so it can help merge with the animal cell. They have protein spikes, which we don't really have time to get into. But in a sense, it's very current and very important because this is how the whole COVID-19 vaccine is based, right? Here's the dangerous part of the vaccine. It's the genetic material. It's the genetic material says to your cell, build this new protein. So your cells build the proteins inside of them until they blow up, right? And that's the dangerous part. This is not dangerous, right? So the mRNA vaccine that you get for COVID-19 is instructions, because you guys know what mRNA is now, it's instructions on how to build these little proteins. So your cells build these little proteins and then your body knows to attack it. So that's what happens. That way when you do get uh, exposed to the coronavirus, excuse me, COVID-19 virus, if it worked for you, then your body's gonna recognize those protein spikes and say, oh, I've been taught how to fight this before, and then it kills the virus. But anyway, we don't have time to get into that. Here's a basic um, demonstration of how it works for one particular type of uh, virus. Again, it has that, in, that membrane is protein. It attaches to the, the, the animal cell membrane. The virus comes in. The protein coat is then dissolved. 
So now we have nothing but the genetic material. That genetic material, then we use some enzymes to synthesize more of it. In this case, we're talking about an RNA vaccine, not a DNA vaccine, excuse me, an RNA virus, not a DNA virus. So they have their own enzymes, right? This particular enzyme reads the RNA and copies it. So now we have two copies of the RNA at that point. One of those copies of the RNA is used as we know what RNA is used for, which is to build proteins, right? So this is how you learned about mRNA prior to today. mRNA is the instruction, right? That's what gets translated into proteins. So one of them does that. The other copies are then used to be put into the new virus, right? So now we have the proteins to make the new virus. We have the RNA to be put into the new virus. We put that all together. Now we have a new virus. And what this doesn't show is this is happening a lot. It's not like just one virus. There's a bunch of them being made. And then finally your cell explodes and they leave your cells and then they go to infect other cells. And here's all, both of those pictures put together in one picture. So there's gonna be no test question where I, mem or I ask you to memorize how all this, all this works. But there it is, that's how it all works. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this little video that shows how it works. Here's a picture of the mumps virus. Again, you can see these little protein spikes, right? Those protein spikes allow it to attach to our cells. And again, uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine, that's what it's fighting against. Or that's what it uses against the, itself in the fight. And then you can see the, the envelope right there. Um, so the one I just showed you, right, they, those were reproduced in the cytoplasm because that was an RNA vaccine, so it makes sense. Because even in our normal cell situation, right, we go through transcription in the nucleus, and then that mRNA leaves the nucleus, it goes into the cytoplasm to be reproduced, right? That's how it normally works. And that last example I just showed you with that virus, that's how that worked. But it doesn't always happen that way. And your book gives this example, herpes virus. As you might imagine, even without reading these other, other um, bullet points, if it's not happening in the cytoplasm, that means it's happening in the nucleus. And hopefully, as you would guess, that means it's a DNA virus, right? Because what do we have inside of our nuclei? We, we have DNA. So it makes sense that if it's hap things are happening in the nucleus, it'll be a DNA virus. But again, I'm not going to ask you to remember the, the fact that herpes virus is a DNA virus. But yeah, it's also responsible for chickenpox, shingles, cold sores, general herpes. Um, again, these are reproducing in the cell's nucleus. We're going to talk about this. I'm really not, I'm not going to ask you any questions about this. I'm going to go through it very quickly. As a matter of fact, it's been a while since I've read your new textbook. I don't remember if your new textbook even talks about this. The old one did. So really quickly, we'll talk about it. The herpes virus, again, it's a DNA virus. But that DNA remind, uh, remains behind in your, in your nuclei, right? So that's what makes it such a nasty little virus. So it inserts its DNA and it stays there. It stays in your genome um, and it remains dormant until something kicks it off, right? Could be stress, could be illness, whatever it is. And then that's when you have these flare ups. Um, so that's why people that might have cold sores every once in a while, right? Specifically in your book, it's your old textbook, gets some numbers. Seven, over 75% of adults have herpes simplex one, which is like the mouth part, the cold sores. And over 20% have herpes simplex two, which is genital herpes. And again, then there's, you know, uh, if you've had chicken pox, you might not obviously have it right now, but that DNA has still been left behind in your, um, in your cells. And that might cause shingles later on. And you can look that up for an independent work if you want. So another thing your book talks about, and I'm not going to ask you this either, because this is not a health and not a health class, but I'll really quickly talk about it. How much damage can a virus do? Well, it depends partially on how quickly your immune system responds and the ability of the tissue to repair itself. So that's why COVID-19, for example, was so bad at the beginning. Well, I'm not trying to say it's any better, but it was a new virus, so our immune systems weren't ready for it. Um, Anyway, a lot of people fully recover from colds because the respiratory tract efficiently replaces damaged cells. We won't even get into that. Again, this is in the health class, otherwise we could have a whole chapter on that. Um, this is different, like for example, cold virus is different than polio virus. One of the reasons why polio attacks the nervous cells, right? And those are not replaceable. So if you attack the respiratory system, those cells can at least be replaced. If you attack nerve cells, they usually cannot be replaced 
which is why it's permanent damage. When people get polio virus, it's first uh, permanent damage. That's why back in the day they had those iron lungs, right? Because they were attacking the nerves. Those were damaged. They could never be fixed. They could never be, they could never breathe on their own. <laughs> so they had to have artificial things like we breathe. Um, breathe. Um, again, this textbook is from your old. Uh, excuse me. This PowerPoint is from your old textbook. In every chapter, your old textbook included this: the process of science. I'm obviously going to skip it, but you can read about it if you want. Um, it's good because it helps you think about the scientific process. But Again, he's not going to have any questions about it. But it's all about RNA vaccines and things like that. So it's useful. There's nothing in the text you All right, really quickly, we're going to talk about HIV and the AIDS virus. And yeah, let's just go through it really quickly. AIDS is the disease. It stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. I'm not going to ask you what AIDS stands for. I'm also not going to ask you what HIV stands for, but it stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. So HIV is the virus that causes the disease AIDS. Um, HIV is considered a retrovirus. This is an interesting virus. Um, it's an RNA virus, but it reproduces with a DNA molecule, right? Which is weird because everything I've told you so far in this chapter and what you need to know, so I guess you can pause what you know for a second while we talk about AIDS. But then after this, go back to what I've already taught you, which is that we go from DNA to RNA to pro protein, right? That's still what you need to think about for the exam, DNA to RNA to protein. But really briefly, we're going to talk about the exception, which is a um, retrovirus, where we go from RNA to DNA. And as you might imagine, there's a, an enzyme that does it, and it's called reverse transcriptase. Which should be easy to remember. I doubt I'll ask you anything about it, but it should be easy to remember because it's in the name, right? Enzymes are named after what they do. So if we're going to RNA to DNA, that is the reverse transcription. The transcription is from DNA to RNA. Therefore, it's called reverse transcriptase. Here's a picture of what they are, a simplified picture of what the HIV virus looks like. So you can see the RNA here in the middle. It brings its own enzymes, its own transcriptase. It's coded in a bunch of proteins, as most viruses are. And then that protein itself is also coated with a membrane, because again, we're talking about a, an animal virus, and that is usually the case. See how it works? It comes in. Again, it becomes with its own reverse transcriptase. So it reads the RNA. It makes a copy of the DNA. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it makes a copy that makes it double-stranded. And again, this is why AIDS is such a nasty disease, so why it's so rough and hard to deal with. So now we have DNA. And then that DNA is then incorporated into your chromosome, like literally into your chromosomes, right? It's not just hanging out in your nucleus. It gets put into your chromosome. So now every time you go through mitosis, right, you're making a perfect copy of the DNA, of the um, HIV DNA. Anyway, from there, it just does what all the other genes in your, in your um, genome do, right? From there, we go through transcription, right? Then we have mRNA. And then it's, uh, we put a cap on it, we put a tail on it, we do some um, splicing, then it's ready to leave the nucleus. It leaves the nucleus where it's translated by the ribosomes, right? In this case, um, it's turned into viruses and then the whole process continues. The viruses come out of your cells and they infect other cells. So that part's uh, what you already know. Here's the new part, right? That whole idea of reverse transcription. Anyway, any questions about that side? Making good time here. Um, again, this is not a health class, so I'm not going to ask you any of these questions. But by thinking about what I'm about to tell you, this will help you prepare for the exam because it really involves the, the, the process of transcription, right? And you are going to get tested on transcription. Um, so first of all, HIV kills white blood cells, and white blood cells are important in the immune system. That's otherwise another reason it's such a nasty virus. Um, the immune system kills viruses. So this particular virus kills the immune system, so it's kind of taking out your defense. Um, at the time this was published, there was no cure for the disease. You can read about it. Things have changed. Write about it for independent work if you want. But the disease was slowed by two categories of drugs. We won't get into which is which, but both of these uh, drugs interfere with the reproduction of the virus. So the first one inhibits the protease enzymes. So in other words, because I haven't told you what a protease enzyme is, Basically, think of transcription translation, right? So the DNA is transcribed, 
We have the mRNA, and this is all, this is all stuff you need to know for the exam. Not for HIV, just the process in general. The mRNA leaves the, the nucleus, and then, like you guys know, it's translated into proteins, right? It's translated into amino acids. What I didn't tell you, because I'm not going to test you on this, is that those proteins are then put together, right? So you've got the long strand of amino acids. But then they're put together, the proteins are put together by these protease enzymes. So anyway, what this does, what this one category does, is it messes with those enzymes so they can't put the proteins together. The other one inhibits the reverse transcriptase. And I'll just show you a picture of the next one, or that one. So remember, reverse, transcript reverse transcription is taking the RNA and reading the code and making a complementary um, strand of DNA. So what happens is people take this drug right here, so when the when the reverse transcriptase is reading the code, it's like, all right, we need to bring in a T. You know, this is what a normal T looks like. But because you have this in your system when you're taking this drug, it brings in this. And I know this probably looks identical to you, but there is a difference. Um, right here, we have an OH. Here we have CH2. Here we have an N3. Here we have an OH. I don't expect you to know what that means. But clearly, you can see they're different, right? And the fact that these are different means you can't have the... the um, Phospho, uh, I didn't read on the name, but the sugar phosphate backbone, they, this will not bond to anything. So when your body tries, if your cells try to use those, and that just stops the reverse transcription process because nothing will bond to that, and that's the end of the story. Whew. Any questions about that? We're going to do this. We've got five minutes. The last thing we're talking about is prions. I'm almost definitely not going to ask you any questions about prions. But again, this is not a disease class about diseases. Um, but really quickly, and we've actually already talked about prions previously, but here we go again. Prions are infectious proteins. They cause brain diseases. Um, so what happens is they're a misfolded protein, and when they come in, into contact with other proteins, and they call those, cause those proteins to become misfolded. Um, anyway, that's basically what happens. Eventually they clump together, and that puts little holes in your brain. Your old textbook, and I don't remember if your new textbook does it, but here's a list of some of the diseases. You can look any of these up for independent work. It causes scrappy and cheap, chronic wasting disease in deer and elk. So if you hunt, you might be familiar with these. Uh, mad cow disease, that was really big back when I was younger. That was a big thing in the news. Uh, Cutsville Jacob disease, that's big because it's uh, humans. And then Kuru, and I, I know, I think I have talked about this before, but that's a really one, an interesting one if you want to look it up for independent work because Kuru was basically spread from cannibalism. But you know, it's in the brain, so when humans were eating other humans' brains, then that's how it got passed along. So any questions about that? All right, again, this PowerPoint, this PowerPoint was made using your old textbook. So for that reason, it includes this thing called the evolution connection, because that was at the end of every chapter of your other textbook. But I'm not going to ask you any questions about that. However, the last word for attendance will be yearly. So again, you guys can just send in the words, but if you're watching the video later at a later date, use it in a sentence. And that's it for the day. Well, that's it for lecture. We'll see you in lab. And I'll keep an eye on my email and see if you guys have turned into lab. Because again, if, you, if I grade your lab before it's time to come to lab, then you don't need to come in. <laughs>